<laughs> almost literally a baton beat. <laughs> it was. Yeah, we, we, we'll do the, <laughs> the full bright. <laughs> uh, you, if I'm queued up, then I'm yeah. actually. Can, can everybody hear me if I just speak normally like this? Can you hear me at the back? Okay. Somebody's waiting. Okay, well, I'm just, but if everybody basically can hear me, I prefer it rather than that because you get echoes and it's a bit difficult for some people to hear even at the front of that. Are you okay with that? Great. I just don't like looking like Tony Bennett. Uh, for, the, for the old uh, greens around here, he was a singer. Uh, my name's Alan, Alan Wirt. I'm from Equality Northwest which is the Northwest branch of uh, something called the Equality Trust, based in London. And funnily enough, with the, word in, with the word equality being repeated twice, we're about inequality. That's what we do. We are, uh, if not a pressure group, we're certainly an information exchange. We're, uh, we were formed by a, a group of academics after a book called The Spirit Level was published a couple of years ago, which has really become... Uh, the bedrock upon which inequality is understood in this country and we're really quite grateful for that because it's evidence based not ideology based. Uh, so I've been invited to spend a couple of minutes speaking about uh, privatisation and its effects on inequality and vice versa which I'm more than happy to do. Um, if I, I was going to say rather than me steering it, do, would you, if I just give you a nod you'll advance it one on, would that be alright? Thank you. So my beautiful assistant will, <laughs> will advance the screens on one when I sat. If you could do one now, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, what we're talking about, in terms of privatisation and inequality, is a really simple question. Who gets the benefit? Is it the mass of society, or is it small, select groups of private individuals organised in various different ways? It's the core of our economy. Where does the benefit go? We're, uh, and, and I'll just talk about one thing. To, to really understand that, you need to understand what the state budget is, what public goods are, what natural monopolies are. But stop, it's not a lecture, you don't need to switch off now. I'm not going to go into detail on those things. I'm just going to make one point. And the one point about this is, the state spends a lot of money on things that aren't natural monopolies. You got that? If you could just about one. The natural monopolies, the state goods, the public goods that we all know about are things like this. <coughs> Defence forces, roads, fire services, sewerage services, police services, and a whole lot more. I mean, there's just only so many pictures you can put up there. Those are public goods. Those are the things that we pretty much all accept. <coughs> we should all have in public, not as part of our private individual budgets. It makes no sense, and we've learned it over a good few hundred years now, that it makes no sense to pay for them individually and to have competing services. It's, can you imagine competing fire services? It really doesn't make a lot of sense nor policing services. We've learnt those lessons, that's why we're in an advanced Western democracy. This is one of the fundamentals of what we've learned. You do these things publicly because it makes more sense. Of course, recently, and I mean recently in the last 65 years, the NHS was added to that list as well for exactly the same reasons. We all get the benefit at the point of entry, not when you have to pull a credit card out to actually do something because you've broken your leg, or your child has a bead stuck up its nose, or even something more serious. We all pay through it through common taxes, and we all get the benefit for it. You'll, you'll have to forgive me as well, because this is the first time that, as an organisation, we're doing this speech, and I, I want to make sure that I don't miss things out, and I, I miss this speech. So, Apologies for me referring to notes about this. The, we know that the NHS is a, is a valuable service, and it's exactly why it was added to the list of public goods. It's an incredibly valuable service communally to us all. Just ask Americans who use it when they come out. Um, the, the point about them 
however, is we don't expect people who supply, i.e. what the state spends out of our taxation, to help these things get organised. We don't expect them to supply it for free or at a loss. We did expect them to, to do it on a commercial basis, but what we expect is that the terms under which those supplies and services and goods are done is on a fair basis so that the benefit remains reasonably socially, reasonably with the common good, not that it just gets siphoned off into the Cayman Islands through various commercial vehicles. And you may think that that's actually where most of the privatisation issues are. It's about supplying things on the state budget. But actually that's not true. Of course some people make a lot of money. And some people do it in a corrupt fashion. Which is unequal. It's unfair. And they get more benefit to small individuals than the rest of them. <coughs> but by and large, that's not where the gross inequality comes from in terms of privatisation. <coughs> The biggest problem in those kinds of circumstances is just plain incompetence. It's inefficiency in the way that we do things. We're not very good at buying aircraft carriers. That's actually going to cost us all. That's the problem with that kind of issue. Not that somebody's making some money that they needn't have made out of that. That goes on, but it's not by far the biggest issue. If you really want to see privatisation in action, you have to think bigger. I mean a lot bigger. You need to think in industry terms, sectoral terms, like the energy sector or the rail transport sector, all of which used to be thought of as public goods, but are no longer. And by no longer being public goods, the benefit isn't shared. It's not fair and it goes to a small number of private people. For example, the rail sector has been analysed to death in the last 35 years. <coughs> However, one of the best analyses is done right here in the University of Manchester by one of the sections under the department, by the Cresc unit, which has just finished its funding. I've given you the, the link there. It was, it, it was a report called amusingly enough, the great train robbery, about the privatisation of rail services. And, and here are some of their conclusions. I'm not going to read them out to you. You can read just as well as I can. The issue is, however, that instead of delivering efficiencies, instead of delivering better, more efficient usage of things, instead of delivering cost savings, all that's happened since the rail services have been declined is that we have worse reliability worse customer service levels, worse safety levels, and we're paying on average 24% more than we would be if they were being organised in the safe sector like most of the European sector is. There's a huge, badly hidden, although some people still get fooled, but it's, it shouldn't be hidden, it's a cross subsidy. Every year of nearly £4 billion given to the train operating companies. We just put say something that's not on there. The train operating companies deliver 90% of the profits they make a year in dividends to their owners and their shareholders. Well, that's not us. That's not the public. That's the bad side of what privatisation does. And that's just the rail side. If you could go on next, the next side is the energy industry. Again, used to be a state sector, used to be a public good. <coughs> no longer. In the last 20 odd years, again, there's a whole host of analysis that has been done on the energy sector. And you're probably, anecdotally, at least as well informed as we are in evidence and, and report terms as to what's happened with energy prices and what a pain it's been to try and cross and swap between them and just how goddamn useless some of them are and exploitative some of them are. And believe me, you don't need to tell me. It gets picked up in the, in the report. The latest reports about the whole sector are <coughs> that our price levels in this country are at least 10% higher than they need be operating under the state sector and that they actually are in most of our European neighbours and cousins in terms of running their energy sectors largely in the states. Some of them, like for Germany, have 
particular ones where it's not run by the central or the national government, it's run in regional areas, but nevertheless, it's still run <coughs> as a public good, by and large, for the public good. Very interesting, um, I'm, I'm sure Natalie and, and the whole green, green team know what's happening in some of the state lender at the minute, that a lot of the, the city councils are taking back uh, ex-private companies that are floundering and running them on a communal basis now. So there's quite a lot of large cities that actually have bought back out of private hands and are running them in public hands in different sectors. I think that's an incredibly valuable thing. Denmark's been doing it for years. It's almost at the point now, if you just sort of go back one, where it's impossible to conclude that we shouldn't renationalise the rail sector and the energy sector because there's nothing else to do that we can mess it up with. It's too obvious. However, while that provides a great deal of money for a very small amount of people and a very great deal of damage and no use to the rest of us, that's not the biggest individual privatisation problem that this country has. The biggest privatisation issue we have is an accounting trick called PFI, the Private Finance Initiative. Terribly, terribly boring for lots and lots of other people other than accountants like myself, we find it terribly sexy. However, to try and simplify it, here's what the Private Finance Initiative is. It's a contract, normally for very large capital goods, like whole hospitals or whole sewerage works or whole schools, which are you know, they're quite big elements of our economy. And the government writes a contract with a private sector supplier where they will pay the capital costs for building the new thing in exchange for a long-term operating contract at incredibly favourable terms. And that's how you pay them back for stumping up the initial cost of building the school or the hospital or the sewage treatment. The difference, of course, is that the incredibly <coughs> beneficial operating terms pay back the cost plus interest of the initial capital scheme far more times over than it would have taken for us to have done it originally as by putting it on our own credit card or going to get a loan as a government. I mean, I don't mean just lots of, I mean, Wonga scale <laughs> multiples of it costing. Here's the latest report. Even the government knows that this is a scam. The National Audit Office, thank you for putting that, that's perfect time. <laughs> the, the National Audit Office reported in 2011, which is um, 13 years after these, these schemes started coming into operation by the government, that the use of private finance initiative schemes has increased the cost, so it costs us more than it should have done. And the price of finance, so it's not just that we're paying back the initial cost more, the cost of the finance is far higher than it should be. This is Wonga land, it really is. What are we talking about here? How many are we talking about? Just advance one, please, man. Assistant, thank you. We're currently saying 700, this isn't a small thing. 717 projects have been written, of which just under 650 are currently operational. We're talking 10 to 25 year terms for these things. These aren't going away. This issue is a problem for all of us. But frankly, looking at my grey hair, it's a major problem for you guys because soon is when this is all going to blow up. 648 are currently operational. The capital cost that they supplied, which were just under £55 billion. Pounds. Think that's a big number? It's not. If you can go on to the next one, the cost that we're going to have to pay is more than £300 billion pounds on those projects. See why I use the example of Wonga? I've given you some references for that for you to go and look at it yourselves as well. That's the biggest privatisation issue as an individual thing that we're all faced with. Even the government now says through the National Audit Office that they should be taken on. 
But just a last point about this. Why were private finance schemes done in that way? The answer is to keep the capital cost off the government's books. So that they didn't have to say, we're going to spend 55 billion quid on this. <coughs> and hope that nobody notices that the cost for keeping that 55 billion off the government borrowing figures, the debt figures, is 300 billion. Was it necessary to do, to keep that, those debt figures off the books? No. Government debt is the lowest it's been for nearly 100 years. It's remained so for more than eight years of the times that these projects... It's the most incredible time to borrow money to fund these things because the cheapness of it is never going to come back like this. It's an incredibly bad decision. All major parties <coughs> have bought into this neocon rubbish hook, line and sinker. Now, I'm angry about that. And I think you should be as well. We've got two problems facing us. Climate change and inequality. We have to address global climate change in order to save our society. But we have to lower inequality to have a society worth saving. Thanks for inviting me tonight. I've enjoyed it.